Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today I have with me Anthony Taylor, who is the CEO at SME Strategy. Anthony has facilitated st strategy sessions for organizations big and small across North America and beyond. He is the author of two books and the host of the Strategy and Leadership podcast. He holds a degree in business administration with a specialization in marketing. Anthony speaks fluent French, loves soccer, and one of his life goals is to visit every major league baseball stadium, which sounds like a lot of fun. Welcome to the uh, podcast today, Anthony. Thank you. I am just over half. It is a lot of fun and uh, both doing the strategy work and visiting baseball parks and eating hot dogs. So uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on the show today. That's a lot of fun. What a fun uh, goal to like i love that goal where did you come up like why why that one uh you know i think that there's like an architecture component of it uh oh. but fundamentally because of, like i'm not like a big baseball fan by any yeah. means but okay. because of the nature of uh the work that i do uh, i can i think i've worked in something like 20 or 25 or 30 of the actual like states and i'm in vancouver canada um and so just every time i go to a new place i kind of made it like a fun like to do and then the next one i get to go to wrigley field in chicago um so just something that kind of choose your own adventure as i travel the world I think that's great. I think it's great to have those like very fun and playful things and goals in life because um, people who think strategically, sometimes we can get in our heads a lot. And uh, so it, it's, it's nice to have those things that keep us human uh, and playful. So, okay, question. Um, I know that you use the StrengthsFinder in your company, right? We use it internally, and then for our implementation clients, we have a Strengths Finder module uh, to support greater teaming. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I ask what your top five strengths are? Oh, uh, do it's know? been. I don't have it at the top of like one is unsurprisingly strategic. Yeah, uh, futuristic oh. is my number two. Arranger, activator, and woo. So all things that align with good strategic thinking and strategic execution and, and uh, people galvanizing so to speak yeah did learning that help you in in thinking about what you wanted to do or in how you're doing it how did that what was the impact of it on you um i will say okay so i did the original strengths finder september 2026 or 2016 because it's in my linkedin bio um and i think that that was kind of like a nice to have uh, uh -huh. but when we did it as a team I will say it created a huge breakthrough with me and my chief client officer for us to understand how our idiosyncrasies were compatible. And it helped us get a good insight into who we are and how we think so that we could respect that in one another. But in terms of like me starting the company started in 2011. So at that point I was kind of five years in, but mm -hmm. I guarantee you that I leveraged those strengths Mm -hmm. to get the company to where it is and even just in its formation right 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 do do you have you seen or do you guys use it in a way that like beyond the sort of self-awareness and then awareness about each other like have you seen it being used beyond that we like, incorporate it in our quarterly uh reviews to discuss like to go over it we're using it to bring new people in um when our clients have it it's again a, like more of a like team forming storming kind of thing yeah. uh but i wouldn't call myself an expert in it yeah, by any means. yeah that's but i was just curious because i just think it's interesting to see how people use assessments that that one in particular um so you wrote a book a few years ago called alignment how to get your people strategy and culture on the same page and so i was wondering if we could just start with some basics you know growing companies sometimes operate under different definitions or the idea of strategy you know all that is kind of confusing sometimes when people are first or if they're if they're aspirational thinking about i want to be in a leadership position where i am thinking about strategy so what what is the difference between thinking strategically creating strategic initiatives and strategic planning Ooh, okay <laughs> how long is the podcast okay let, let's think about it let's try to break it down in a slightly different way strategy is about choices it's about what you do or don't do and not doing something is a choice and what people often don't think about is when you say yes to something you say no to something but conversely when you say no to something i'm not going to go to that party it allows me to say yes to reading a book at home which is 
choosing. Then as it relates to where you want to go, there's like strategic planning, which is looking into the future, determining what that success is, and then making in principle strategic choices along the way to get you there in as swiftly and effectively as possible. And then there's the initiatives, which is doing the important things that should have a correlation between getting you to that outcome. So for example, if I was trying to be fit and I was trying to weigh 220 pounds and dunk a basketball, it was 20 years ago, but I digress. Then I say, okay, I need to, my strategic initiatives are work out doing plyometrics two or three times a week, uh, make sure I'm swapping my yogurt for chocolate cake, but the other way around. And, um, you know, reading the science of how to jump better. So those are the kind of initiatives that I'm taking that in principle should get me to where I want to go, but it is kind of the high level things distinct from the individual day-to-day -day choices that I could make that would accelerate the path. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer the question in terms mm -hmm. of linguistics? Yeah. So your company, you guys focus on strategic planning, right? Correct. And what does that look like um, in terms of what you guys do and, you know, companies calling you up and saying, we want help with something like what, what how do they do that? What do they well, say? Fundamentally, the biggest thing that we do is support teams with alignment. You know, are they on the same page first and foremost? Cause it's, you know, if everybody has a different place that we're going to, we're not going to the same place. And so first, what we do is help teams figure out where they want to go um, by using our five-step process for alignment, looking at where we are, where we're going, what's going to get in the way, what do we need to do to get there, uh, and then how are we going to implement the plan? Um, but then fundamentally, there's the components of the vision, the mission that will support good strategy creation. Mm -hmm. um, so having a vision that's clear, having a mission that aligns with the vision, having values that support all of that. And so what we do over two or three days or a couple of sessions virtually is help teams align their way towards that place and kind of reverse engineer work backwards in terms of what they need to do to get there. Yeah. What is the difference between vision and mission? Because I think sometimes those get a little confused. Okay. You're asking so many good questions. Okay. So the way we look at it is vision is where you want to go. And the mission is akin to purpose and why you do it. Um, so the mission is, you know, we provide X benefit for X people typically. Um, and whereas the vision is as of X date, this is what success looks like. And we would know if we got there where I think some organizations get tripped up. I'd say two major places. One is, um, conflating a vision statement with a vision mm -hmm. as in a vision statement often sounds good but doesn't say anything <laughs> whereas like a vision a true vision everybody knows where they're going and you're either in or you're out uh, and then the same thing with mission a mission statement sounds good but doesn't actually say anything or they use too many buzzwords for me i don't like the word solutions as my clients know it's like say it in the words of your customer so they would see it and know what's in it for them versus you intellectualizing it so that's one uh two is actually the orientation um and most people don't think about this because there are for-profit businesses let's say generally speaking and non-profits or mission-based organizations and so for most for-profit organizations the vision of the, the top where they want to go and the mission fundamentally helps them get there but for a nonprofit organization, I found that it makes more sense to reverse them because they fundamentally exist to live their purpose, mm. uh, to, you know, give housing security, to provide justice. You know, there's like the, the being is more important. And then we say, if we do the being to the best of our ability, mission first, then our vision as of X, Y, Z date will look like this. So finding the right thing that fits will drive the psychological levers of the people which is why strategic planning isn't necessarily about the document, but more about the human beings and their context for driving the work forward. Mm. Does that track? Yeah, yeah. So what makes a vision or mission statement more tangible and uh, better? <laughs> is it open to interpretation? Mm. If it's open to interpretation, it's probably no good. Uh, I just had a call with somebody and I might've already thrown my notes out, was basically like, let's not make things confusing. Let's make sure that they're clear and specific. So if your vision is open to interpretation and different people could go there, then it's probably not good or said another way. Uh, where are you calling from, Andrea? Where's home for you? Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay. So let's say, and I'm in Vancouver, Canada. And let's say, Andrea, let's go to California together. Do you want to go to California? All expenses paid with me? Sounds great. 
Fantastic. Well, your version of California could be going to Los Angeles. It could be, uh, you know, five star hotels, eating like little tiny sandwiches and going shopping. And that's not a judgment call. That's just whatever. And then for me, it could be San Diego, uh, watching baseball, having some beers, uh, sitting on the beach. Someone else might be San Francisco, Napa Valley, going for wine, going to museums, da, da, da. By the way, I went, I, my honeymoon was in San Diego some time ago. So that's why it was relevant for me. Anyways, it all sounds good. It all sounds like the same place when you say California conceptually, just like, hey, we want to grow our business or have more impact. But what does that really mean? Because once you start getting into it, it becomes confusing. Yeah. Once you actually get there, you say, this is not where I wanted to go. This is not what I signed up for. Yeah. And so, you know, five-star hotels or Airbnbs, like all expenses paid means we could be hitchhiking. You know, so there's so many, so many, so many considerations that CEOs or executive directors in their best efforts of giving something that's visionary don't recognize that there are so many different ways to interpret it that it's not explicit. It's implied. And the you get lose people in that implied area. Do you, do you think that those, the vision and mission statements or one or one or the other needs to be both very, um, achievable? Uh, is there an aspirational, is it okay to be aspirational in that statement? Uh, I've seen, I'll comment after you comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that because the nature of the work is so that you move your organization forward and it's actually doable and that you want to celebrate success. I think that you should have your vision be aspirational and achievable. Mm. So if you're going to say, I have a gajillion, bajillion dollars in growth, that's not realistic. Therefore, you're automatically, people are going to be, there's no chance in hell. I'm not even taking the next step because I know the last step is impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's kind of thing. Yeah. It needs to be achievable. It needs to be realistic because we're actually looking at it and distinct from something like a, 10 or 20 or 30 year vision, which we don't recommend in most cases, yeah. we're looking at three years down the road. Yeah. So even if you stretch three to four or even four to five, you got to at least be able to get to a place versus it's a moving, what do you call it? Like, you know, when you move the goalposts, Yeah. it just disengages people. Why would you play a game that you couldn't win is what I ask people. And if you set up a vision that's never going to be achievable, nobody's going to want to play with you. So it needs to be far enough out that we can aspire to do it in that sense, but it's uh, and it's going to be a challenge, but it's it's not impossible to reach. Far enough that it's strategic and close enough that it's operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. I don't need to comment on it further, but I've seen it be. I've seen it. I've seen situations where um, maybe the the vision or the mission were were not achievable, and so that I think. Um, there's probably a reason why some of those organizations fail, um, because it, it's hard to get behind that. <laughs> well, look, it's, I 100% agree and said another way, if you can't achieve it, you have already failed. Yeah. So it's like the, the, the first step. So like for us, like you won't see an SME strategy plan that's not achievable in principle. Mm -hmm. um, but why it's why it happens so often, as I think for our listeners to consider, is it's hard. Like it's hard enough to get 10 of your friends to agree on a place to go for dinner and make yes. everybody happy, let alone the future <laughs> of a hundred million, 200 million, you know, $2 million organization. So it's because they kind of quit before getting to that live level of rigor because they think it's good enough. And unfortunately it's not. And so when people think about strategic planning, it's like, oh, it's two to three days away, but it's governing three years of work for dozens or hundreds of people. You know, it's the most important thing you need to do to set the direction because you're investing millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars in payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just slight, slight variations on that direction at the very beginning doesn't they don't seem like they're a big deal. But the further you get, the further apart you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so. When we're talking about alignment. There are kind of different levels of the organization that need to be aligned to the strategic plan and what your what your company is doing. So what are your thoughts on the sort of different tiers or levels of people or or, or pieces of the organization that need to be aligned and to, to focus on? And obviously everything you could say everything, but like, what do you say to focus on, um, you know? 
okay. executives so through is... contributors, structure, whatever. Absolutely. So this is multi-tiered, you know, no pun intended, but, but let's call it there's stakeholders that need to be aligned before going through the process, generally speaking. So those stakeholders could be above or below. So let's take the case that most of your listeners are probably executive team members, but they may also be board members or they might be middle managers. So let's just assume that. So depending on the organization, if there's a board, the board needs to be aligned because the board's job is to give direction to the business or organization. And there's the executive team. The executive team needs to be aligned because they're the ones doing the work to drive the business forward. If I'll say most of the time, the executive team can create the vision and then either align the executive team to roll it down, or they have the vision that they're going to roll up to the board or some kind of conjunction where it's rolled down, rolled up. And then you get your senior managers in and then everything else from there. So that's one version of alignment. The other version of alignment is uh, strategic alignment at the top. There, uh, There's alignment between the priorities and the vision. So are you aligning the things you need to do to get you to where you want to go? And then are you aligning the rest of the organization to get you there? And of course, you know, how we design our process, everything is in alignment. So our current state, our celebrate aligns to our current state, aligns to our pestle, aligns to our vision, aligns to our mission, aligns to our values, aligns to our risks, aligns to our priorities, aligns to our objectives, aligns to our goals, aligns to our actions. So that you can kind of see the narrative as it rolls up to 30,000 feet, but also can see the granularity, specificity, and actionability as it gets to on the ground execution. Mm. It's just like, it feels very pleasant to hear that string of alignment that you just said. <laughs> that's the kind that you're like speaking my language when you say that, but I know that not everybody thinks strategically, not everybody like wants to put that kind of effort into not just strategic planning, but the, the alignment process that it takes to do it. And I'm wondering, like when you see people resist, I'm assuming you see resistance every once in a while. Um, when you see people resist, um, what do you feel like they're resisting to? Like maybe they they feel like we're we're going overboard. Like you're, you're, this is too much alignment. You know, like can't we just like have this particular you know one or two three things that we're we're focused on instead of you know the whole string that you just mentioned? What are you seeing when you see resistance? So when I hear resistance, it's resistance to the process of planning versus resistance to the rest of it. Sure. Yeah. We're both, okay. but yeah. Okay. Cause there could be, you know, if, if you just both. talk to me about resistance there, there could be a dozen. Okay. So let's, let's say, um, let's say there's resistance to just going through the planning process and taking the time. Um, and, and, We've all, we've been fine without a strategic plan before, you know, why do we need one now type language? So the way I like to think about it is you do two days of planning and 1100 days of implementation. And so you should resource sufficiently. So if, you know, if you're only doing those two days, even two days is small comparison to 1100 days, which is three years, uh, give or take, don't at me with the math. Um, so it's like, it's not really that much, truly. Um, the other way to think about it is like, depending on the size of your organization, like if you're a one person organization, a one man band or two people or three people, then maybe you don't need to do that much planning. So I'm not going to tell you you have to go through two days. I will tell you that every year of our company's existence, we've done a strategic plan. I had a 20 year strategic plan. When I started the company, we work with organizations that up to a billion dollars and some fortune 100 companies, sub teams, and they do the planning. Uh, another big brand I know does 17 days of planning over three weeks to plan out their three years. So that like, if you think you're doing a lot, you're not. Um, but I'll give you a story. Great. So one day I was driving to an appointment, I knew I had an appointment. I knew more or less where it was. It was pretty close. I was just kind of, you know, going on my deal. And I was like, you know, jamming out to my music, having a good time. And then I'm like, whoa, there goes my exit. I'm like, ah, no big deal. I'll double back. I turn around. I'll get there. I won't be late. I'll, I'll good. So instead of a 10 minute trip, it was a 12 minute trip. No big deal, right? Two minutes. Who cares? But then if you think about it for your organization, what if your organization was 20% over on everything? Mm. Your budgets were 20% higher. Your expenses were 20% higher. You were 20% behind on all of your timelines. You know, for an organization that's like, let's call it a small organization, a million dollar organization, that's $200,000. 
a $10 million organization, that's $2 million, a $100 million organization, that's $20 million. So that 20%, while seeming small and innocuous at a small scale, is astronomical as you scale. And so if you don't have the time to do the planning, well, you risk going 20% over, which doesn't seem that much. But if you've got 10 staff, 20 staff, 100 staff, like you really need to make sure that you're investing that time to make sure that they are effective. The other way that you could look at it is, great, you don't want to spend the time? That's fine. Do you people know where they're going? Do they know what they need to focus on? Do they know, you know, where they're, what, what are they actually doing when they show up to work? So I don't care about you, the person who's actually in the strategy meeting. And I tell people that, and I say <laughs> it as respectfully as I can, but I care about your employees. And if you, if you care to pay the bad management tax, go ahead. The bad management tax is people quit your jobs. They are low engaged. They are apathetic. Uh, you pay higher salaries. You do more perks because you suck at leading. Choose. Uh, so if you don't want to spend the time, you don't want to spend the four hours, you don't want to spend the day, you don't want to spend the two days, that's okay. But you pay for it now, you'll pay for it later, but you always pay. Yeah. Hopefully it yeah. answers that question. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, okay. So strategic planning, kind of a, a, a system or, um, you know, the things I'm sure that you wrote about in your book are, are pretty much a, um, you know, they, they live they exist through time in a way that is important. Like it's, it's not, it's not a time bound kind of a situation. However, mm -hmm. we all know that a lot changed over the pandemic. So I'm kind of curious what has changed about how companies are approaching strategic planning since you wrote that book. Okay. So I think suffice it to say the speed of changes are going faster. I think that the pandemic changes were transformational in terms of it kind of shifted the balance of power away from employers and to employees. It was already shifting from purchaser to consumer. So I think it changed enough dynamics and increased the, let's call it just general operating costs. And it, everything is more expensive. Everything is more complicated. Everything is higher risk to it. Um, the winners are winning greatly. The losers are losing greater than ever. And I, we could talk for just to do a whole show on societal inequity and we won't do that right now unless you want to. Um, but basically it's harder to run a business. It's more challenging to run a business. You can't afford bad decisions because that 20% is actually 30% or 40% or that 20% will put you out of business. Mm. Uh, and so I think holistically, people are recognizing the need to do that. But I think at a deeper level, um, the purpose-driven nature of human beings is increased. Therefore, they demand and expect a higher level of responsibility, response and ability mm. from their managers and leadership, such that they will tolerate less crappy management because they know that they can get a job anywhere. They know that they can work for themselves. They know that they can become an influencer should they really want to. Um, and also that the transparency of bad management is greater than ever. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things, I think immediately coming out of the pandemic, the like great disengagement or whatever it was called, it's because it showcased the system failure of these organizations to guide people who were off-site or asynchronous. And so it was just a system. Some people were able to navigate it, but it's basically, if you're not being micromanaged, you're not able to be managed. And so I think it highlighted that. And then it also highlighted as the priority shifted for these leaders, it, they were able to or hadn't adapted to what was required to support their people. And both of those things created gaps. Um, even pre-pandemic, we were advocating for three-year strategic plans because five years is too far. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to psychological safety, behavioral expectations, and the ability to have an adaptive system and responsive system versus a system that reacts uh, because if you react, there's too much competition, too much change, uh, you're SOL. Oh, yeah. Okay. So many <laughs> questions. Uh, okay. The last part, uh, the adaptive, having a, an adaptive system that is able to respond instead of having to just react to the environment. Can you expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah, I think it's the nature of like, just like call it processes and systems in general. So as we look at strategy implementation, it's not just doing a bunch of stuff, but having sufficient systems, processes, structure to support the ongoing growth and scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so those could be technological advances, like not limited to AI, dare I say it, but like those drips from the external start influencing and, gra and being like gravity pulling you to look at that shiny object. People and culture, you start hearing it from like big tech. And so it's having pulls on your system. So you can't kind of escape it. Um, you're having like big organizations, big tech, and these guys that are having rapid growth and scale, there's uh, private equity companies gobbling up organizations, there's market consolidation, there's businesses going out of business. And so all of those things put pressure on your systems to adapt to the changes. And so whether it's a people system, whether it's a culture system, whether it's a finance system, whether it's a technological system, whether it's just a system for the communication so that you can manage Asana, ClickUp, Slack, Zoom, are you a Teams place? Are you a Zoom place? Are you a, dare I say, WebEx place or whatever? Like all of those things are, are that are systems, but they're pulled by people and their expectation because the world is their oyster and you're inundated by information. There is always like new stuff. There is always new stuff. And some of that new stuff is good, but the new stuff puts a pull on your old stuff. Mm -hmm. And then your ability to incorporate change or leave it alone consciously um, is is what managers, leaders, individuals have to deal with because there's always a shiny object. Mm. Okay, so if a company, this is fun, by the way, okay, good. I'm glad. Um, if a company is, they're saying, okay, we need to do some strategic planning. How do they decide what pieces of the business to focus on in their strategic plan process? Great question. So we, uh, we at SME Strategy uh, incorporate a needs-based approach versus a wants-based approach. Mm. So as we go through the strategic planning process, we say, here we are, we want to get to there, what's going to get in our way? And so we identify risks and roadblocks to accomplishing what we want to accomplish. And Real then quick. we, yeah. Bef so the, the, we want to get to their piece. Yeah. is sometimes the part where the, they get confused. They're not sure about at the beginning. So like, do you, do, do they know that before they come to you or are they figuring that out as they talk to you? No, they definitely, well, I don't want to say they definitely don't know. I guess the point is, do they agree on where they're going to go and do yeah. they, are they all going to the same place? Um, I often tell the parable of Alice in Wonderland where she gets to a fork in the road and she asks the Cheshire cat, like, which road should I take? And then he says, where are you trying to get to? And then she says, I don't know. And then she's, and then he says, well, then any road will get you there. Yeah. You know, some organizations focus solely on the road. They forget about the destination. So that's why we literally call it our one destination model, because we want to get people to the one destination versus what we call the multiple destination trap. If you're in the multiple destination trap, everybody's going to different things. They're going to prioritize differently. Uh, you're going to end up spinning around the circles. You're not going to make any decisions and you're going to be stuck. And you think that having a lot of opportunities is a good thing, but in fact, it paralyzes you into indecision. Okay. So uh, where we are, where we want to get to, what's going to get in our way. And let's prioritize the biggest things that are going to get in the way. Uh, I have some. I make the joke analogy. I think I'm funny, so I make a lot of jokes. And I say, you know, let's say there's your house and then there's this like shed on fire or your garden. Do you spend the water on the garden that's right in front of you or do you spend it on the shed that's on fire? Most folks focus on the like low risk stuff because I wouldn't say most folks, so that's not fair, but it's easier to focus on the stuff you want to do mm. versus the stuff that you need to do. And by putting a, as good as I've been able to create it, risk register to prioritize those things, it always highlights what are the biggest priorities that we need to focus on. And then we start there because those are the things that are the levers to get us to where we want to go. So if you don't know where you're going, you'll never be able to get there. If you're prioritizing wants over needs, you'll never get to where you want to go. And you probably have more needs than you have time, money, and energy. And then you still have to choose. Right. And that's, I think, what people resist is because they don't want to say no to something. They want to do it all. But by saying yes to everything, you do it crappily versus yeah. doing a couple of things really, really well.
or in the words of Ron Swanson, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. So in your, your, you, you do this strategic planning process, at least in person over a couple of days, how much are you investigating about the company and their needs and wants before you get to that point? Um, so I'll say relatively little, but my real answer is as much as needed, but not more than that. Yeah. Uh, and so we, ahead of every strategy session, we do two things at a minimum. One is interview uh, about half of the leadership team um, to you know get their perspectives on where the organization is, to dig deep into certain themes and to understand their needs, wants, and common language. Mm -hmm. We'll also do a survey uh, with the you know whoever's participating in the strategic planning process to ask them some of those key questions, such that they can answer them on their own time, where they can give good time and thought. They everybody answers. We send out the survey for everybody else to review. So it's kind of a pre-alignment. So we can see where they are at. They can see where they're at. Mm -hmm. And then we combine that with our in interviews to kind of like triangulate the truth. Um, and then in certain cases, we do additional stakeholder engagement with, you know, for example, the board or other middle managers or, you know, call it like listening sessions to see what everybody else thinks. And then we use all of those inputs to the strategic planning process, creates an output, we take that output, we roll it back to the organization for validation. They say, yep, that sounds good. And then we implement. What are some of the biggest hiccups or roadblocks you've faced in the process with, with uh, clients? Uh, I would say chiefly people overthinking. Like our strategy process is not perfect. And I'll use the word it's good enough. But most people try to get perfect where good enough is what you need. Yes. Um, you know, it's like it's iterative. Now, it's, I will say it's comprehensive. It's complete. It's very, very good. But it's not the end all be all. For example, let's say you set a goal today. Well, it might not be the best goal. But the only way you're going to figure out if it's the best goal is by setting one and then adjusting. Yeah. Uh, you asked earlier about what are some of the resistance pieces people resist setting goals because as soon as you set a smart goal, like specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound, it introduces the idea or possibility of failure. No goals, no failure, no failure. Don't look dumb. So people don't want to look dumb. So they will resist setting smart goals. They would rather do nothing than do the wrong thing. And that's systemically a part of strategic challenges. Uh, another big one is wrong perspectives. So, when you have an executive team and a set of middle managers, if you have both of them doing a strategy session together, they have different lenses on the organization. So you can't fault them from bringing their own perspective, but a CEO is never gonna have the same perspective as a middle manager, a VP of finance is never gonna have the same lens as uh, an accountant, but then you have to align them and it's a big pain. So I wouldn't do that at the same time, I would do it in different sessions. Um, and then another one would be kind of like siloed thinking where those same executives think about like my team versus us as an organization or their way their departmental hat versus their organizational hat mm -hmm. to start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. When uh, executive teams come together and alignment is going really well, what do you think they're bringing to the table themselves? I think it, it's a willingness. You have to be willingness, you have to be curious, you have to be open. And one of the things, you know, I can't remember at what point you said, you know, strategic planning isn't going away, nor did SME strategy invent it. In fact, I have a book over here of, you know, people, I stole their ideas. And of course, I don't say steal, it's, you know, inspired by, et cetera. Sure. The point of that is I didn't invent strategic planning and there's gonna be somebody who comes after better. The point of it all is, is that there are folks who've been in business, in industry for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, all of them learn strategic planning differently. Mm -hmm. They all learn different words. They all learn different approaches. Some of them have the best ones. Engineers are typically bad, but that's another story. Um, and so when people come to like, okay, I know what I want, but I'm neutral to the process, or at least I'm accepting of the process because it's a process that all of us go through, then they get the best results. Um, so they have to be satisfied not only with the outcome, but the process that led to the outcome. Because they're not always going to get what they want, but as long as they can feel like the process was fair, uh, democratic, dare I say, or at least there was clear ground rules, clear decisions from like how the rules of the game are going to be played. Mm. At the end of it, they feel satisfied. Hey, it was a buttload of work. 
Um, you know, we had our challenges, but it was nice. They feel physically lighter at the end of the session because all of their anxiety, all of their worries, all of their doubts like melt away because now it's specific, clear, actionable, intentional, and then they can actually like get to work and they don't have to spend all of that time in that like thinking gray zone. So what do they get when they bring their best selves? Be curious, be willing. Uh, eat a lot, like bring good energy. Um, the worst thing that is very subtle and most people don't think about is like snacks. Like if you don't sufficiently fuel and sustain, so sustaining fuel, um, you will have a bad strategy session. So healthy snacks, unhealthy snacks, both. <laughs> because different people need different energy at different times. And calorically, strategic planning is a very uh, intensive activity. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um Okay. When you start to see leaders or, or business divisions kind of diverging from the, what you'd already determined was the priority. So there's starting to be a divergence from that. At what point do you recognize, or should the company be, what should the company be looking for that says, okay, this is, we're, we're going too far off the, we're, we're, we we've diverted too far what's the red flag that they should be looking for that okay we need to we need to come back to center um i'll answer it a slightly different way is it for a good reason or a bad reason fair because there are certain let's say you sat a, created a strategic priority a year ago you work through it you either accomplished it or you didn't accomplish it it doesn't need to be the same priority it was the priority. Like if you had set a strategic plan in 2019 of January, 2019, and then if you kept with your same strategic plan, likely for three years, it was probably not the right thing to do. So like, is there a good reason that you're changing the plan? We've accomplished all of our things and it's no longer a strategic priority or strategic need, um, or just generally it's not a strategic need, or it's a bad thing. Are you just not following the plan? If you're not following the plan, why? If you are following the plan, why? And so just like being really curious as to what, what is causing you to pull over there? And if it's a good reason, then let's do it. In my opinion, a good strategic plan should not be prohibitive to opportunities uh, because you don't want it to limit. Like if there's a good opportunity comes out of left field, it's going to change your game. You're not going to be like, well, our strategic plan says this. And it doesn't <laughs> say anything about that. So I'm not going to go after it. But you can't just start chasing every dog that barks. Uh, and I think that's the like rigor of an organization. But how do you build that rigor? It's constant communication as to where are we going? Why are we going there? What are the priorities? Why are they the priorities? And should we change? And practically speaking, then, like, how do you stay on top of that? Because the tendency, I think, in a lot of places is to say, great, we have this strategic plan. You got your plan. Now go. And then we don't check on it back in on it until our next annual meeting. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, what do you recommend? So as part of our, so we have an implementation programs to support organizations with their accountability and fundamentally organizational growth and pillars of that are our follow-up calls once a month for operations. And I call it strategic operations, the strategic plan stuff, mm -hmm. and then quarterly for strategy reviews performance, qualitative and quantitative performance. Uh, in between that, we have workshops to develop the skills and capacities, going back to that like process stuff for goal setting, communication, collaboration, culture, leadership, et cetera. So we're imbuing strategic stuff throughout all of our organization. Um, but I think the cadence, I guess the keyword A is cadence. Some call it a rhythm. Um, and then making sure that it works for you. So you might be in crunch time and your rhythm is once a week. You know, you might be in pretty good mode and it's once every two weeks. You could be in real crunch time and it's two or three times a week. Mm. But like making sure that there's a consistent reminder um, of where you're going, why you're going, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if it's not that, then you will forget it. And your strategic plan is not a document, but rather the environment around the organization to support the implementation of your plan. Mm. Oh my goodness. This has been such a fun conversation. We've been like going fast and furious here. <laughs> um, but uh, where, where, a couple more questions. Where can people find you and your business and your podcast and your books? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Anthony C. Taylor on the internet, there's an Anthony Taylor that's a soccer referee and he's not very well liked. So Anthony C. <laughs> Taylor, uh, smestrategy.net. 
Uh, he's the easiest way to find us. If you Google basically any strategic planning question and then put SME strategy at the end, you'll likely find some sort of video article, something. Uh, strategy and Leadership Podcast, available everywhere. Uh, uh, books on alignment and uh, entrepreneurship work I wrote called uh, I Wish I Knew Entrepreneurship Lessons I Learned the Hard Way So You Don't Have To. Uh, you can uh, Google that, find that on Amazon. But smestrategy.net. Uh, is the best place. And I would love to personally connect uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is my jam, um, but I also got like, you know, a bunch of people on YouTube that watch our webinars and that kind of stuff. Great. We'll link to it in the show notes. Sweet. Um, and then last question. So this is the Voice of Influence podcast. What last piece of advice would you want to give somebody who would like to have a voice of influence in their company? Oh, well, this is my, it's a John Maxwell quote, but I, but I do like it. I'll give you two if I have. One is a leader with no followers is just going for a walk. And so if you want to lead, you make sure that people follow you. But the like more practical Anthonyism out of that is that people don't care about you. They care about themselves. So if you want to have a voice of influence, speak to that person's heart, not yours. And as a leader, it's not up to them to adapt to you, but to you to adapt to them. But when you like have their heart, then that's when you can actually like have influence. Uh, and I think it's another John Maxwell. It's like, you got to connect before you pull. So if you're not connecting with your folks, you have no influence. Uh, so don't just start pulling. Great. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Anthony, for being a voice of influence for our listeners. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much. It was very fun.